Um, so maybe I can skip over the intro again and just um, talk about um, what will happen today. Um, I think we, uh, yeah, today's session was um, initially we, we, we were aiming for it to be like a sharing of how the MA service design students have tried to implement um, uh, transition design theories or methods um, practically into our service design projects. Um, but yeah, like um, based on our discussions, I think because our projects are still very like very much in progress and still very rough around the edges, I think some of our sharing today will not be, it will sound like a complete case study of how like um, transition design has been practically applied uh, into a project, but it could also sound like new reflections on how learning transition design theories has influenced our design processes. Um, and yeah, just generally reflections on how we've, uh, I think we've all like kind of attempted to <laughs> integrate some of these things that we've learned in the past two sessions into our projects. And I think there has been some reflections uh, on that. Um, so today we have four uh, people sharing. Um, and then I think we will spend about 15 minutes or so with each project um, where we'll hear from the student and then we'll have some discussions around like, yeah, what, what we've heard. Um, and in the remaining time, um, we will open it up for like questions and discussions. So in total, we're expecting this session to take uh, one and a half hours. So just a heads up, go grab water, go grab drinks um, if you want. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, please everyone, if uh, please feel free to like um, add your questions or your thoughts or comments in chat um, as we go along. Um, and uh, final thing is, yeah, we are, we are hoping to record the, these sessions and put them up on YouTube. Um, if you are uncomfortable with being recorded at all, like do let me or Alex or Aya know and we'll, we'll try and um, work that out with you. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's that's all I have. Uh, Alex, do you have anything to add? No, let's get going. And I think the first on the list is Ada. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to be presenting some slides that I prepared for today. And as Damien was saying, I would say in my case, I don't, I have not tried directly the tools because my project has been kind of transitioning during the time of all this. Uh, but I think the sessions and the reflections, especially on system thinking, has really helped me to be okay with this transition in my project and this change. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And to do a little, do you see my, my screen? Yeah, all great. Yeah. To, the, to do a little bit of recap, I started my project with, oh, how, how can I support conventional farmers transition into regenerative practices for uh, the biodiversity in this land? And I did a bunch of interviews with conventional farmers, which you can see here. Um, I also did some interviews and visits with regenerative farmers and organic farmers. And all these led me to kind of like three main insights to my project, which is Oh, the production distribution channels, um, mainly they're feeding into each other and they are in a chain of making this industrialized um, farming a problem and a wicked problem. At the same time, the alternative that regenerative farmers have are not um, that viable, so making it not attractive for conventional farmers to go on board. Then the second one is the training and knowledge and collaboration is quite different between conventional and regenerative farmers. And the last one is the visions of the future and how it was so challenging to do that and to do this visioning with farmers, especially conventional, which led to in, in action into the present because they were not projecting themselves into this future. Um, so all these I chose to go more with the first direction because I start, start brainstorming and I liked more how this was leading me and the ideas that I was having. But meanwhile, all this project, I wanted to build a systems map um, co-created, um, of course, um, this, and, and it was quite a hard thing to do with my network, but I had the chance to um, get um, and see and meet 
these people that actually had mapped a system, you, it's not meant to be seen because it's from far away, but uh, this system's map of Catalan food system, um, which was actually built during six months with Generalitat de Catalunya, which is the local government and uh, research institute and validated with farmers, with different people in the sector that I didn't have access to. So I asked if I could use this map, um, but what I would say, which was most useful from this session, which was actually after our first session with you, uh, was that she said, you're looking into the place of the map that has most resistance. Uh, please <laughs> go somewhere else because it's going to be so hard for you to do this. Uh, so after this first session, I realized, OK, this is not working. So why if, what if I start supporting regenerative farmers? instead of conventional into finding a viable model so that others might be more on board into doing that and this becomes more mainstream. So I started brainstorming a bunch of ideas. What if schools are food hubs? What new models of food banks? But I kept thinking, but who is my network? You know, like who will I talk to? I don't know anyone in this new landscape that I'm trying to approach because this was not my initial place in the system and while this we had a session with you um cameron and you said this which kept being stuck in my brain uh, which is okay systems are, are nested and also adjacent and i was like okay go back to the map look at the other systems that are related and and, and adjacent to this system that you're trying to tackle so um, this is a caption I'm not going to go deeper into the map, but I was going for the purple area, which is finding alternative models. Uh, but right next to it, there is this yellow area, which is more based into research development um, and innovation on, uh, for sustainable food systems, which is fed specifically in the area I live in by EU funding. And with all this, I actually had a contact which whom I was already working with that is a communication partner for EU funded projects in farming. And then I'm like, maybe this is my entry point to the systems. Maybe what I need to do is to go someplace where I already have someone that can help me and that I can find more impact. So that would be my second learning. So how to look at adjacent systems and their relationships. And from this, I went from, okay, trying to support directly farmers and all these ecosystems of distribution channels that I didn't have any access to, to actually going to fund, um, EU funded projects that have engagement with farmers and doing that through participatory revisioning tools. Why participatory revisioning tools? Because that was already my collaboration entry with this agency. But then I was like, okay, how do I do this so that it benefits them, but also so that it answers to my research question? I went back to my insights. This was actually one of my big insights. So it actually went together with my project. Um, but yeah, um, within all this, I started working with this agency and I saw that their new strategy for next year is to engage more farmers. So there's where I saw the opportunity to make this synergic for myself as well, like for my the project I was trying to do. Um, so what we're doing now and where we are, I'm not going to talk much more because I realize I'm talking for a long time, is we uh, have this visioning workshop on the futures of agriculture with the Revolve team, which we're kind of like designing together with um, with the um, head of office in Barcelona right now. And basically it has two main objectives. The first one would be this pilot, this workshop is uh, the pack that we had from the beginning. I'm going to do a workshop on visioning on agriculture for Revolve teams so that they improve their capabilities of visioning. But then there's another objective which is answering to my research question, which is accessing my um, community that I was trying to tackle from the beginning, which is what if this is a pilot? It's an effort that we then iterate so that this workshop and, um, and thing could be actually implemented into this shared visioning with other partners in EU funded projects as, as well as farmers, and especially to make sure that the futures that are being built for these projects are also preferable for farmers, not all the other partners in the system. So yeah, I think that's where I am now. Um, I would say to sum up that transition, I have not used a specific tool in transition design, but actually all these conversations and systems and the, when we stayed after our talks with you um, to reflect together, 
I think it really helped me to be okay into taking turns into the project, which apparently are not related, but if you look in a systemic way, you can see that there's actually a relationship between what you're doing now and what you were trying to do at the beginning, because there's a relationship in the system. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm not sure, Damien and Alex, how, how you want the protocol. Have you all seen this work? So is it just for me to comment or, or do others have comments and questions? Um, I think some of us, we've spent um, some time with each other to like talk and reflect with each other. Um, so some of us have heard this a little bit before, but yeah, okay. not, not all of us. So it's really open for everyone to, yeah, you know, if there are any questions or thoughts and yeah, I think primarily also for, to hear from you, like what, what you think and what's coming up for you. Okay. okay. I'm getting an echo, but it's gone away. Um, uh, so I th thank you. you. You, despite you saying you're kind of in progress, it's a very clear story. You tell the story very clearly, and it's it's interesting to think how you will begin to tell the story of the work. And uh, obviously, telling kind of the actual origins of the work is always helpful. If if the audience, you know, who who might be your 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 tutors uh, uh, at school or or whoever else you're talking to, but you know that version was was quite nice to kind of hear obstacles. And the fact that you, uh, as you said, have been transitioning, you kind of see something you wanted to do, but it's not quite right. So then you go back and you try and project something else and you try that. And now there's these kind of other opportunities. So I think that, that story was very clear. Um, and it it reveals things. You're telling a story about yourself, but reveals something about the system at the same time. So I, I would pay attention to that because that's actually what you want to communicate when you finally get to the story you want to tell. And so the way in which um, some of the obstacles reveal something about the bounded nature of certain aspects of the system or the moment at which people are kind of unable to kind of get into a, a kind of visioning state of mind and things like that. So if the, if the moral of the story, if the outcome of the story is a sharing of the system and not just you telling process story, then the process story, I think, is a really useful way to kind of frame um, the whole thing. The kind of questions I had that I just didn't actually get a little bit from the story was that the adjacent system is, is researchers. I suppose I did get it. And then you're going to try and teach visioning for the research. So the researchers don't currently vision or or do? Yeah, no, I, I didn't go deeper into that, so it's understandable that you didn't understand. But uh, basically, what I'm what I'm going to be doing is supporting EU funded project partners into um, integrating these capabilities. And when I kept talking, because at the beginning I was like, okay, but you don't do that, and are you actually the ones doing it? Because you're the communication partner is where I have access. But what they were telling me is that more and more in these projects, they're involving all these tools because they've seen that are really useful for participation. So it's participatory tools, but yeah. one of those tools is visioning, um, right? And besides the projects themselves, what the agency is trying to do is they're realizing that right now they're communicating, but maybe not for farmers, and how do how can they go closer to the users that they were actually doing the projects for? Right. Um, so one of the options that we were proposing is doing these engagement workshops with farmers, and to do so, it's the pro the proposal is to um, use visioning tools to actually build something in those workshops that is not just a place to talk and a discussion group, but actually a workshop where they get something out of of there. And right. looking at my research, I thought that that made sense because I actually saw that there was lack of visioning skills and was what was one of the barriers for them to actually see a future on no. farming and actually, in, I don't know, encourage their kids to, to take the, uh, the, re the generational replacement, etc. Yeah. 
so but what I'm hearing there are both farmers and researchers for different reasons lack a capacity around visioning. And you've realized that if you try and teach the researchers visioning, you should be trying to teach them participatory visioning with the farmers and that you will prototype that. So, so the one thing I just draw attention to, I don't, it's a sophisticated theory, but it's used a lot in service design. People talk about it. So it's uh, uh, Lee Starr's ideas of boundary objects. And they're um, often used, often misunderstood. Lee Starr had to write a whole essay about the many ways in which boundary objects are misunderstood, which is always fun when somebody has to do that. But it, uh, so I might be getting it wrong as well. But one of the things about a boundary object is that it sits at a boundary. So it sits at a boundary, in, in your case, between farmers and uh, researchers. And one of the important points that sort of Lee Starr makes, I think, about boundary objects is often we think of them as moments of sharing in which people are in a common third space. And whilst it's true to it, that I would recommend having the workshop in a third space, not in a university or uh, consultancy or at a farm, but trying to find some other third space. I literally think that's quite a, that's a good thing to do to indicate that you're pulling everybody out of where they normally are. And no one's, it's no one's home territory, but it does make it harder to invite people. And I'll come to recruitment in a second. So a lot of people think a boundary object is successfully translating from one system to another. But Lee Star is in fact insisting it's the one thing that is understood in two completely different ways. That the farmers think they're there to do this type of visioning and the researchers are there to do this type of visioning. And it doesn't matter that they don't have the same mental model of what's going on. What matters is that they can actually engage in that space. And it, that's obviously really hard to design because it, 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 it kind of helps to be bilingual, which you are anyway, so, you know, or trilingual. It's really helpful to think I'm in a space in which two people are, are talking and there is a translation, but the word doesn't translate, but it doesn't matter because they both know I'm talking about red in this kind of case or, or their version of red and that version of red. And so that's a bad example anyway. So it's, it's just something to kind of think about when you construct the workshop that everyone will occasionally feel like they're speaking the same language and they won't be speaking the same language, but it doesn't matter. It will still be productive for the two separate systems. So that that's a way of taking what we were talking about in terms of adjacent systems uh, and their structural coupling to this idea of what you're trying to do here. Now, where that gets really practical on the ground for this next step is if you are going to pilot it, if you are going to prototype it, and you're going to have to recruit, as I said, the recruiting is going to be really tricky because you already know people are kind of a little bit hesitant about this. And so you have to you have to find versions of visioning that farmers are doing, which is, as you just, I think, gestured to at the end there, is already kind of intergenerational transfer thinking, what are the kids going to do? So they might not be happy about doing visioning, but they have a discourse about the future. They have a discourse about change. And it's a matter of recruiting people on that basis. And in the same way, though the researchers don't do visioning what you're talking about in the way you're talking about it or the way transition design talks about it, they have some sense of an outcome for the end user that is preferential, which is why the funding was given in the first place, which is kind of obvious, but I'm just trying to say you have to kind of recruit them. It's almost duplicitous in which you're telling one group or oh, you're coming to do this, and you're telling the other group, or oh, you're coming to do this. And then you construct a workshop in which they're able to begin to get what they want from it and feel that they're moving, but not necessarily coming together. And so it, it's, it's a really interesting thing to try and sort of master and or measure when you're a service designer leading those types of workshops to feel like both groups are sort of coming and they're not joining, they will go away having had a different experience, but the two experiences were com compatible and s separately productive for them in that. So it just might be a useful <clears throat> way for you to explain it, not 
when you're recruiting people to tell them you're going into a boundary object of two separate things. But uh, to try and explain it uh, to your tutors, etc., to your, your studio leaders, that this is this is what this experiment kind of is. Um, yeah, did that make sense? Yeah, it does. It definitely does. I think it's it's such a different way to see it. But I, yeah, I will explore it a bit more. And I actually did never understood what boundary object is till now that you are explaining it. So <laughs> right, right. I gotta say that our pilot will be just with the team at the at Revolve, which is the agency. Okay working with but the objective is that they actually implement it but it's giving me a lot of ideas on how supporting them into do this recruiting for afterwards in the project right maybe that's not going to be part of my project because of timing but maybe the project in integrates all these tools to actually do the recruiting right, right. Um, so yeah thank you is it um a slightly controversial question but is is it uh it's it's catalan in catalan is, is the language no. of the workshop? No, no, because it's Spanish. gonna be, and I think that's one of the problems, which, um, because they work in a European setting, but then the communities are really local, and they work in English because I'm gonna be doing this with the team in Brussels and Barcelona, right. and Portugal and Lisbon. So it's people all over Europe. Um, so this needs to be adapted afterwards to the context of the projects that they are doing. Right, because the projects are maybe in, t in three cities, but the communities are really different in, in the three places. Right, right. Yeah, I'm just trying to wonder, like, given that 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 issue of multilingualism is, is always present and then also quite politically fraught, obviously, in, in Catalan, um, without drawing attention to it, which would get you into trouble, it's a, it's a useful thing to just kind of recognise struggles for local autonomy might still be compatible with federated governance. That's another type of boundary object. Like if, if there can be Catalan government within Spain in the I ideal world, whatever your politics, it, there would be a boundary object between the two, uh, which is kind of, oh, okay, so yes, you are independent, but you are part of the nation as well. Um, you know, so that's a that it's a liberal dream that you can get to that. It's kind of pluriverse a little bit. Arturo Escobar's pluriverse in the same way, in a way, but it's useful just for kind of getting people to say, "I'm also trying to find ways in which you can have some autonomy about creating local regenerative agriculture within a larger system, which is hopefully starting to slow down and break and relocalize and things like that." So it can be this metaphor, and it might be useful to have a a kind of visualization somehow of of boundary objects in that way and um just just to kind of have this theme that this is and this is also what the researchers are, are trying to do because it's also kind of the language like i know revolve sound like more like activists but you know researchers have this funny habit of flying into a community creating a great big model which isn't the, like the map is not the territory but Obviously, the two, uh, like the, the map is a boundary object in that way to the territory. And so just trying to sort of get the researchers thinking the way in which they're heading already towards this kind of adjacent system shifting. Sorry, that got a little complicated. I don't know if it's yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, can you jump in here? Thank you for, for sharing, Aja. Thank, thank you for the thoughts, Cameron. Um, hoping to like keep time for uh, everyone to share. So I think you can, if, if you're already, you can move to hearing the next project. Does it sound good? Yeah. Yeah, it's me. Wonderful. Right, let me <laughs> see who get, uh, if the slide sharing will work as it should. Please, God, please. Can people see the slides? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Right, so um, my project is mostly about uh, the um, amplifying the role of time in the process of service design. And the thing that really grabbed me, uh, similarly to kind of a phrase that Ada uses, was something that you said about the Max Neef matrix in that it creates more interesting humans for us to work with within the context of service design, right? So it allows us to look at people who were trying to help in a more nuanced and sophisticated way. So 
part one was trying to grapple with what even is the max sniff matrix of needs and how can one use it in real life because if one kind of starts looking at the whole matrix right the one that you shared has roughly 100 satisfiers the more complicated versions have even more and uh, trying to create a workshop or even explain to someone that like, go and create your persona or understand your needs out of these 100 things is quite a challenge, right? It requires uh, like quite a bit of sort of sophistication, but also it's kind of unclear what those mean, right? Because even in a simplified version, when we just look at existential and axiological needs, once again, it requires quite a bit of explanation, right? It is unclear to me how one can walk into a workshop space and expect someone to understand what protection and being means, right? Like we can broadly understand the protection, but the difference between say protection and substance, subsistence as a need are not really clear. So these kind of require really a human to explain what's going on. So the only way that I could find to really turn this into something that could be quite useful and useful for what is the next bit of the talk, is to essentially recreate this kind of matrix for every individual project and specifically talking in the language of the people who were co-designing with, right? So say in the context of a service designer who is tr working for local government, uh, what does axiological need of affection mean? What does having it even mean? Uh, speaking of which, I found looking at different translations of being, having, doing, and interacting to be actually quite useful. And the German term befinden for interacting describes, I think, the idea of locations and environments quite a bit better. So that was kind of me trying to grapple with this tool because this tool could be so useful for the following two things. And this is coming closer to what I'm trying to do. One of them is visualizing varying needs over time. And this comes from a small project we did in Seoul, South Korea, a few months ago, where we were try working for Universal Design Center and trying to quote unquote, humanize the experience of taking a train in Seoul. And this is the way I'm trying to visualize kind of the complexities of human needs, but specifically that the way they change over time. So, for example, uh, this is a very simple user journey of a commuter going to well, the office, right? They do it 100 times. They've done it 100 times, so they're not really looking for new inter interactions. But they basically have this broad cluster of needs called a routine, right? Which is why they get out of home every morning, right? It's in green. And it's something that gets them to actually get going and something that carries them home. Um, but kind of it is mis misplaced by idleness. For example, for another person, this may be a way to time to catch up on their phone or doing some emails. But often you see on a train someone who is just for whom this is a peace of mind, time to daydream or to brood, right? So this is kind of another need that arises at a particular time. And then there is what you see in red, a very specific kind of point based need, which is when you need to take out your phone or your card or your cash and pay for transport, right? So this kind of looks at uh, this doesn't place those needs into an hierarchy, but rather looks at them as flowing in different ways. This would, of course, be very different for, say, for example, a tourist for whom there is no real routine cluster of needs. They're dealing with something like navigation, which is a combination of curiosity, like and trying to investigate how does this new unfamiliar system works. And because they're tired, they want to get to wherever they're sleeping to get some food and rest. Uh, for them, idleness is less pronounced, perhaps, or maybe more, because it's a new, kind of going to a new place is fundamentally quite different. So I'm looking at those clusters and how they flow together nicely. The way this can be looked at practically is this is a very badly drawn part of a project I'm working on with uh, Camden Council, which is trying to plot the needs of uh, a human in this case uh, this is a broad timeline of a human from the point of their birth versus formal and informal institutional support right and what kind of needs do they have and what kind of needs are satisfied so for example support from 
there being a nursery is not only support for the parents with childcare, but also support with food, support with community and so on, but also a specific type of community. So how would like, uh, so the key takeaway is that the approach that looks at human needs, this constellation of kind of Max Neve style needs can change in priority over time, can be actually quite valuable. And just as an example of a real design work uh, that unfortunately fell through, but may still be interesting, was trying to apply this approach to redesigning an educational service, which is having this problem. They have a gigantic thing of onboarding where they send you like a billion emails, which is where there is everything you need to know and no one reads them. And then the actual course happens. And then as the whole course happens, people who haven't read the onboarding, they become confused and angry and so on. So I'm trying to design a tool that firstly would plot the way different needs uh, change throughout this 12 month long course, right? So at some point you may want, you may have an acute need to access login details. At some point you have acute need to learn or sometimes you just need some time and then figure out how we can break down the onboarding process into bits that align with those changing needs and then redesign the course into something new that is a bit more plausible, doesn't have this horrible spike in the beginning and looks makes a bit more sense. Right, and that is me, thank you. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's really wonderful. Um... It's made me think of, of uh, so many things. So I, I think the insight that, well, to push to push it a little too far, it's an insight that we are different people at different times in a service journey, and so it's kind of the error of a persona that you're just one agglomeration of certain kinds of needs and wants as you move through the service. Uh, which so I think there's a kind of really interesting challenge there to just say um not 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 only do your needs shift but insofar as we are nothing but constellations of needs where the person who's in the middle of the journey is a completely different person to the person who's beginning the commute and ending the commute um so that it just caused me to think about that and i hadn't i hadn't i had never thought about that at all um i think your attempt to um toolify in a good way NEF into a kind of uh, service journey version of service design is is a really great experiment um, and I think there's some really good clues here and I would just like generally say I'm really keen to see this keep going um, in that way. The only thing that occurred to me while you were speaking was actually a point that Ben Reason made in some little LinkedIn post about a month ago about service design and actually he put it in a slightly cancelable way so it was a bit problematic but he was um talking about traveling and how difficult it is to get a ticket from some european country i think it, i think he was paying out on italy and so it was that kind of um prejudice which i thought was could have been handled more sensitively but he was trying to do it to say the struggle to converse and get a ticket on a train in Italy, if that was the example. Uh, I don't mean to repeat his maligning of Italy in the stereotyping, but as a tourist, the struggle to get a ticket is part of the pleasure when you win, like when you succeed, like it's a game and it's a challenge and there. So I say that because the, the only thing in your visuals that, that causes me uh, to reflect critically is the idea that a spike is bad, the idea that smooth is better, that, that we, we want. It, things can escalate. They, they can go up and down. They just shouldn't be spiky. But um, I think it's always important to kind of imagine that, that, that there sometimes is, like we said before about role stress, there can be something focusing about the sudden moment of urgency um, and not just because it's a challenge where you might win and then there's the risk of losing and you've missed the train and now you're going to be late for work and it's a disaster but but just in that 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 also is part of what is recognized in the Nephian framework Max Neef's framework that challenge is something we also kind of occasionally need so I don't think you meant to say that 
Um, I just think the, the the mode of illustration that you've chosen, particularly this one that's on the screen at the moment with these Mount Everest-like spikes, um, just make it look like really stressful <laughs> moments. In, as, I know you're just saying, like, I have to get my ticket out, but it can be, you know. Um, but, yes, sm smooth isn't great. Uh, and then no, I suppose that's the only other thing, just to carry the theme from the previous comment about boundary objects. There's also just this interesting moment of how long it takes in your curves and how one does the shift in mood or the shift in Befindlichkeit, you know, the shift in kind of the way in which you find yourself um, from just routinized at home, suddenly like, I, am I going to miss the bus or train? Where's my ticket? And, and then this kind of like de-escalation and this moment so that sort of transitional moments in the journey, um, I think, is interesting. And then the last comment is just, you know, I think all of the projects, and maybe this goes to the existential angst, transition design is primarily about transitioning design, right? So you're trying to, you're trying to learn how to do design so that you can help societal transitions. But you always are also trying to convince fellow designers that they have more agency than they think. They just need to think about different things. They need to start working with adjacencies and visioning, and 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 that that's they're not used to it. And clients don't want to do it. And you've got to sort of make the space. Conversations we've had over the last few weeks. So when you do this, it's a really interesting thought experiment. It will also change service design. Like you are in the middle of changing the dominant mode of service design, which is the customer journey map. And if somebody can un unseat the tyranny of the customer journey map, you will change the world. It's, it's the lever that will move the world. <laughs> um, so I think it's that, that's why it's kind of important work and it's just really interesting. So there's, there's great experiments here. Um, it, it would be great if those little collections of post-it notes could could also be illustrated or dramatized or or visually communicated um, other than that. Sorry, that, that was a bunch of different comments. I, I hope that made sense. Ask me any questions, but also, yeah, any other comments about the, the work? No, thank you. Like kind of this was this is currently a project on trying to change the practice of service design a bit. Although yep. I'm pivoting away from that out of desperation. So uh, so not pivoting away from that, trying to add an extra element with actual users. Yep. So, yeah. I think just just the sorry, the other comment that just makes me think one other quick comment. Um the you know, the word need is always kind of problematic yep. in English in particular, but so the need to get your ticket or pay is a very different type of need from a Maxnefian being uh, um, for affection kind of need. Yep. And so I like that those things are on there, but you might need to find a way of kind of communicating something like it's a, it's an activity. I mean, I think I, I do quite like in Alan Cooper's version of Personas that there's an activity goal, the literal thing you've got to do, you've got to get your ticket out of the pocket. There's the interaction goal, the quality of that interaction that you like. I like game-like ones, I like fast ones, I like automatic ones, I like it to feel technological, that kind of stuff. And then there's the kind of life goal stuff, which is a little more Max Nefian in that I am somebody who is seeking to be with others. I'm, I'm always heading, heading towards interacting versions of me satisfiers. Um, so it might be useful to just kind of somehow get that I'm trying to get my visual grammar right, but the the sort of the types of needs and then activities and what activities do. And activities require actions and you need to do something, but the needing to get out your money is different from the need to feel affection. Yeah. And it's not to say that that's wrong just and, or, or ambiguous. That's exactly what you're trying to think about. You're trying to help people see the relation between a prosaic instrumental need and an existential need. Yeah, there, right. there is kind of yeah. There, I don't know how much time we have, Damien, but like there, there is kind of a 
uh, there's another version of this where the need for routine is expressed, for example, like a cloud or a field, right? Because right. It doesn't like it doesn't quite have a line in the same way that other activities do. But then we come back to the difficulty in distinguishing between being, doing, uh, right. directing, and whatever the fourth one is, uh, which are quite specific terms which yep. are not easy to translate in real life. But I also love that if it's not a like I think we have the tyranny of the up and down something is either positive or negative something's either stressful or not stressful so i quite like that you're literally like you're in this place so you're the inside of the german translation to kind of say you're in this place and it feels like this and then you're in this place and it has a very different type of feel so that that might be useful and, and instead of people just drawing up and down lines on the bottom of a, a service blueprint mm -hmm. thank you for sharing um yeah, we are just right on time, I think we can uh, move to the next project. That is Lily. Yeah. Hi, uh, just give me a minute. I'll just share my screen. Uh, it says I need permission to share my screen. Can you please give me permission? <laughs> Let me try. Uh, yeah. hmm. Or I can just send you the file and you can uh, share it if that's faster. Uh, OK, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, can I check if Alex and Aya, do you see any options to make Lily? Because on, on my end, I, I see that Lily is already up. No. Yeah, quick and pleasant section is everyone, is the color yeah. setting. You should be able to share it. Um, yeah, but you, yeah, maybe you, you share it on, on, on Slack with us and then we can present it for you. Um, I have shared it on WhatsApp to uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know. It's still not allowing me to. Uh, let me try again. Nope. That's I got it. it. I'm going to share it now, and you can do a next slide, please, onto me, and then it will be fine. Yes, please. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Cameron, my project is around understanding creative systems and how creative people sort of work with those systems. If you move on to the next slide. Um, the context, uh, I'll just quickly sort of take you through it, which is basically creative jobs um, are cast as dream jobs or, you know, passionate jobs. And uh, if you look at the data or how creative people are actually feeling is really just the opposite. So there's a lot of feeling of being unsuccessful, underappreciated or general ignorance that they're work is not valued and this has really intrigued me because it's also very personal and um, it's also a very reflective project for me to undertake um, can you move to the next slide please um, so like uh, what i'm trying to really understand is that it's a very simple thing to sort of yearn for a workplace that nourishes you that sort of you know creates that space where you can create an impact you can have people around you it's a very natural and simple thing but then again there is this thing about system overpowering individuals and it's not that simple anymore so um uh, I've, i was really trying to understand this relationship between creative uh, systems or organizations and um, how they're related to creatives and designers. And the next few slides are just sort of one aspect of the project, which um, I have done in the last few weeks. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, 
I think I wanted to understand how creatives and designers are feeling about the agency and consultancy space. And there were a lot of sort of different um, responses of it. Um, I have tried to club this into three things. Um, there's this obvious lack of work-life balance. And uh, the second one is more around how the, the creative work itself has become very templated. And irrespective of where you go, you end up doing the same work in a similar fashion. Um, and the third one, which I personally find very interesting, is this growing apart from the job, which if you go more into it, is about how your work that you're doing is no longer reflective of your own personal values. Um, and then there is this gradual thing about creatives feeling like they have lost the agency of self. And the only reason that they do something is because either the client is saying or the boss is saying. And there's this constant questioning of self-worth. And I find the third part really interesting because the first two, I, I honestly feel they are given. It's unfortunate, but this is uh, right now very normalized. Uh, if you move to the next slide. Um, and this is where I, I think that, um, you know, it's it's a very interesting place because if you look at growing apart as an emotion, it's a most natural yet a very painful process. And anybody, any professional who sort of decides uh, to not work in a particular uh, space or an agency, it's, a, it's not an easy decision. It's complicated, it's uncomfortable, and yet people are choosing it, right? And it's nothing to do with them be becoming uncreative, right? They are just choosing not to practice their creative skill in a particular space. So um, if you move to the next slide, um, I, I sort of um, wanted to dig deeper between these two things, the creative process and the creative practice, because I felt that when I was talking to, you know, uh, people, they they sort of in between the lines spoke about them as two different things, and uh, which was very, again, uh, quite interesting. And that's where I start, started to explore creativity as a need state. And uh, like most need states, there needs to be sort of a satisfier to those need state. And um, if you, you know, look at Hoffman or even, you know, any other person who talks about these needs, they talk about how it is a continual process and it's not like you have achieved it and it sort of just vanishes. So this continual process of creativity versus the continual practice of creativity seems to be going in like very different directions. If you move to the next slide. So I try to sort of do... Um, you know, some sort of uh, workshops with creatives and designers to understand, you know, a little bit more about their process and practice. So a uh, few things I tried about, you know, like very basic, simple things like the I need to be creative because or I I stay creative by doing certain things. And if you look at the kind of answers that we're getting was um, it was I mean, it was good, but I don't think at that point of time I was um, able to you know, grasp something out of this workshop. And that's where um, your session about the Max Neef, uh needs sort of happened. And uh, if you move to the next slide, I tried sort of adapting my questions in asking them uh, as, you know, seeing creativity as a more dynamic thing rather than a static thing. So I said that, okay, how do you, what does creativity mean to you in being or having and doing and interacting? And I drew up two different things, which was creativity means to you in your personal process versus in your practice or a workplace. And uh, this is still sort of something work in progress. I've just had three people, um, you know, complete the second uh, workshop. But if it, even in these three people, um, I see a difference in between my previous workshop and the kind of, of just framing the question differently, how the results have changed so you can see the drastic difference between you know um in terms of just interacting or just being suddenly there is uh you know you're talking about contributing in the team that's what creativity means and in terms of process inspired is what creativity means so anyway this was like i i tried to sort of adapt those model into uh you know helping me ask better questions within the workshop itself um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, please. I think one of the interesting thing which I am right now uh, struggling to visualize as a part of responses, which one of the people told me was that it's almost like the 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 
the ladder of their creative process is going upwards, whereas the ladder of the creative practice is going downwards. And it was such a stark statement. Um, I have not done justice to sort of visualize this, but then there is this kind of gap that you see between the two, which I, I find um, you know, right now interesting to sort of understand that are, is there a space to intervene or is there a space to sort of dig deeper between the two? Is there even a need to sort of make sure that they come together? So there are a lot of sort of questions um, and, uh, you know, thoughts that I have regarding uh, these workshops that I'm doing right now. Um, and just the last thing uh, uh, that I wanted to sort of bring up um, Yes, please. Next slide, please. Is while I was reading about needs and you know satisfiers and all of that, it I also went into you know um, a pluriverse uh, version of what needs are and all of those things. And uh, I, I found again quite interesting where there is a difference between need-centered design and desire-based design. And again, there is this entire bit of um, a neoliberalism is need-based and desire-based is something else. Uh, it's I, I I think it's um, it's I do I see it as like uh, uh, right or wrong or anything, but I think where I am um, thinking at right now is there are different tools, uh, you know, and at what point of time you pick up a certain tool is something that I'm thinking about, and it would be uh, nice to hear from you of how you see you know the different nuances of one one of these things and where do you choose to, you know, pick up a, a tool rather than the other one? Thank you, Alex. Um, this this is a, a rich project. Just ask, let me ask you a question of clarification first. You, you've been talking to creatives, um, but in, in any specific domain? I mean... Yes, I'm talking to creatives and designers in agency and consultancy spaces. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and designers being uh, more in service or product or, you know, like, inter like any specific or, or all? I mean, fashion designers, interior designers? No, it's mostly related to communication. Uh, okay. So that there is experience design, interaction design, product design, not really fashion design and, you know, okay. other things. Yeah. OK. OK. I think um, this insight about process and practice is is uh, really important. Like it's a really interesting and important one. I'd, I'd not thought about it before. And as you were talking, and then particularly, as you said, this kind of insight of people thinking process is going up, but their practice is going down. And uh, I, I'm not sure I, I understand sufficiently your understanding of practice or their understanding of practice, but in my sense of practice, and particularly with, with that now in English archaic spelling of an S to kind of capture something of the, um, that it is, a, it is its own world. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, it's, there's, there's a film called Being in the World, the movie, and it's uh, a movie about Heidegger and being in the world, and it's an interview with a bunch of Heidegger scholars, and then these people sort of look at people who have a different practice. So there's a Japanese woodworker, and there's a speedboat, and there's a woman who makes um, amazing meals in the south of, uh, the southern part of North America, and anyway... It just sort of, it's a really, it's an interesting film. It wants to be worth watching, I think, because it, um, and it's free on YouTube somewhere. I can send you the link. It it captures the fact that a practice is its own kind of reward. Um, and not just in the sense that it's, you feel like you're doing something, but in the sense that it feels like it's opening up a world. And... I say that sort of weird thing and you're going to have to watch the movie to kind of get it and the way I'm talking about practice, but I think it's really important in terms of transition because often when you try to talk to people about transitioning, it turns into neoliberal zero-sum games about what we gain and what we lose and we're going to have to, like, sacrifice and, oh, you're trying to tell me I should be 
you know, I'm not allowed to drive anymore. I'm going to have to like labor through cycling and walking and catching trains and suffering Alex's like routine and idleness, you know, oh, I'm going to have to do like that. I mean, I could just be, whereas transition is about creating new worlds and it's about saying when we transition, there's a whole bunch of new practices and not just material practices in the everyday activity sense, like you're going to launder differently and breakfast differently, but in that there's going to be a project which is going to be really interesting to sustain. And I can't tell you what that project is now because at the moment we're stuck in fossil fuel based projects and, and uh, you know, we're, we're stuck in these types of institutions and governments and things like that. So, sorry, I've sort of blown it out to say I think there's something really interesting and important in the, the practice bit there. The one thing I was sort of missing a little bit that I would recommend you put in, it's, which you clearly talk to, but it wasn't in the visualization, was the the economic system within which the practice is practicing and the process is processing and and what these people are, are being made to do. And, you know, in that sense, it's not just capitalism and money and, and uh, accumulation. It's the theory of the firm. It's the idea that firms gathering people into agency, into organisations, into businesses is both really productive for getting needs satisfied in singular ways. And you, then you have to work out how to convince people to stay in organisations. So th there's kind of like the place the economy, like the oikos, not not, I'm not being clear at all, but not not the neoliberal economy, but the idea of just like that these people are in organisations doing this stuff, and that part of what you're describing is what an organisation has to do. So, for example, um, there's this interesting theory called exnovation. So there's innovation and there's exnovation, and exnovation is the idea that they go through innovation and at some point it's kind of like, stop innovating, everybody just do it regular now. And what's interesting is that creatives have to do that with a firm, right? You have to somehow commoditize it and you turn into a consultancy and you've got something to sell. And then there has to be some moment of creative destruction. And IDEO did it by literally giving its IP away. So there's these moments in which IDEO deliberately gives its IP away in a Schumpterian moment of saying, right, you're all going to have to develop some new IP now because we just gave it away. We told, said it was design thinking and we put it out there. We, we made the human centered design toolkit. So you better come up with something else. So I think I just wanted to see those dynamics of not just accumulation, but sort of gathering people, regularizing things into a practice with a C rather than a practice with an S, like just routine. Maybe don't call it practice, call it routine. So the routinization of processes and the routinization of creativity um there's a there's a it's a little bit disappointing but there's and maybe you're not at a reading phase maybe you're beyond the reading phase but there's a book by Reckwitz, who was one of the sort of key people um beginning to develop social practice theory and he's written a book called the age of creativity or something and so it's a german sociology of the creative industries and it just picks up some of these things a little bit. So, sorry, that just made me think of some two things. So you had these diagrams, and I think the process practice is really insightful, and I want to see more on that. The background's what I just described, theory of the firm, people organising, innovating, exnovating, routinizing, commodifying processes. I think that needs to be in the background of what you're interviewing and revealing. Um, I think in the, oh, now I've totally lost it. It'll come to me in a second again. I had something else to kind of say that, that was in the kind of foreground uh, and it came to me because I was thinking about Rick Witz and that um, version of creativity. There's another just quick discourse, which is um, what's sometimes called ordinary creativity or silent design. Have you ever come across the discourse on silent design? So silent design is the idea that there's a whole bunch of people designing the conditions in which design happens, but they don't call it design, they don't know it's design, but they are in fact designing. Um, so it was, a, it was a paper in Design 
studies years ago and it's it's kind of been resurgent a little bit in management theory recently. But I think it's interesting to also be thinking about what's going on. Are the non-creative suddenly getting to feel creative? Like a lot of the power of design thinking is all these people who've been in grey flannel suits for in the West for the last hundred years finally getting to play with coloured objects called post-it notes. And it's really, really fun for them, like for the first time ever. And as Rekvitz describes it as well. But obviously if they're doing that, it's kind of a little bit weird if you're a creative and that's the whole pushback against design thinking. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not being helpful in that sense. I, I, I did just think, yeah, economic background, something about this. Um, and it, it may, maybe this is what I meant by the foreground like the satisfiers of work, what are the satisfiers of work? Why, why have we so easily um, managed to um, be so much of what is keeping the current system in place and resisting transition is that the people doing bad things, making bad system decisions, are actually really enjoying their jobs. And and they kind of come away thinking, man, today I sold a carbon credit for the whole of the forests in Costa Rica. And, you know, we arbitrage that forest and it's probably going to burn down in a couple of years because of climate change. But man, I, I did it today. And all the people around them are going, man, that was a great deal you did today. That's incredible. So I think it's kind of something about like what are those social satisfiers which become identity and these moments at which people go to work for a firm and and suddenly are making terrible decisions. So I think these are really interesting blockages on, on transition, what you're talking about, which is why it's interesting. But I don't think I'm saying anything that's helping you. Sorry. So I need no, to jump in here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. We can move to hearing the last project of our discussions. It's Loretta. Gosh. Hi, guys. Uh, so I don't have slides prepared because I literally decide to share something very last minute, like 10 minutes prior to the, to the call. Uh, but I will share my mirror board. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, all good. OK, great. Uh, so I'm working on this project called Transition Refugee Transition Network, which Cameron, you will be participating next week. Um, so uh, yeah, my major project is under the umbrella of uh, that project. And uh, uh, to give a bit background of this project, it's basically to use the method of transition design and uh, look at city as commons to um, basically try to change the narrative of refugees instead of looking at refugees as burdens of a country or city. Uh, what can we do to utilize their knowledge and skills, uh, bring what they have from their background to tr uh, transition or transform the nar narrative into a positive one? How can we see refugees as resources and uh, and that they can bring something to their <clears throat> to their uh, current destination country. And so that's just the background of the work, uh, the project. Um, while I was working on the project, I was thinking, OK, what well, the frame of transition design and the frame of this double diamond 2.0 systemic design, how can like where do they coincide? Um, or what, what, what are the methods to make transition design that's more grounded in a way uh, so that people can actually follow through as they work on a project. Um, what I realized is really interesting is that both of the framework um, have the emphasis on the orientation, the setting vision together, um, which made me thought what maybe like uh, in when we bring refugees together, which uh, which I will uh, introduce more later, um, the emphasis on transition and the emphasis on uh, their own 
traditional ecological knowledge will be sort of the background um, of the workshop or of uh, the conversation uh, so that they can think, OK, what can we do or how can we become change makers? when we participate or when we use the method of design. Sorry, I think I need to mention one more thing. Um, my, in the end, the, the uh, sort of ideas of my ways, uh, my approach of this project is to create a upskill um, pro training program uh, to teach the refugees the method of design so that they could have their own needs met uh, within their own community. So instead of giving them the fish, uh, we teach them how to fish. Um, so that's just a bit of the background. And what made me want to decide to share in the end was um, because I tested something this morning with uh, some refugee practitioner of what I see could be um, the activities um, following the method of uh, systemic design or double diamond. Um, and uh, yeah, basically I tested these uh, initial ideas with them. Um, I will just quickly go through and now tell you what happened. So the first activity will be um, inviting refugees to introduce a cultural artifact, um, something that from their background, um, so that it sets the tone of, okay, you have something to bring to the table, you have something to share. It's a nice icebreaker for everyone, as, yeah, icebreaking activity for everyone to get to know each other. Uh, and the second activity initially I designed was to basically have people imagining a center, a future that's centered around this object they brought um, and what it would look like, how can they co-create co-design with their community for this future, for themselves and for their grandchildren. And what are the things that could change? For example, how will people's relationship change in the process of building this future? Um, and what are the things that could be needed? Uh, for example, material, uh, spaces. And then while they put these, um, their, uh, these leaves on this tree, they're together building a vision tree. And the next activity will be, I guess, the uh, exploring slash exploring of uh, these leaves or these visions that they they work on together. So, what are the seeds of this tree? Like, what need to be what need to be there to make this preferred future happen? Um, by teaching uh, by teaching refugees, um, interviewing each other and writing and observing uh, the conversation together, they're exploring this uh, problem space. This um, uh, I guess the pinpoints that stop this future from happening, and then reframing the questions by putting together the notes, the insights that gather from interviews to so sort of find keep uh, keywords, what does these keywords mean and what does it mean in the current system? Why are they how are they existing in the current system and then forming the opportunity statement. And then we'll co-design together, we'll uh, ideate together and present the ideas um, and sort of envision how this could happen with the, sol the solution they come together. So Sorry, that was not, I hope that explains a bit of this activity. Basically, each of them sort of follows the system design uh, or the double diamonds and uh, uh, th the narrative behind it is they can bring something, they co-create something, they have a vision together and they co-create something by using the method of design. And hopefully when they leave the, work leave the workshop, they have this, um, knowledge of design and they can sort of use it in the future when uh, they face some challenge in the community or when a need need to be met in the community. Um, so what happened this morning was while I was uh, testing this uh, with the refugee practitioners, um, they said from the activity one to activity two will probably take a week 
to sort of have people open up to come to talk about themselves and talk about the visions that they're they're hoping to to invite them to create a future together to envision a future together and um so i got some feed uh, i got some suggestions to basically build more activities in between like what does this artifacts mean to you how does it fit in your life what uh why is it important? Basically identify the values. And then next, together, how can we envision a future? And more specifically, how could it actually, um, uh, how would it look like on a day-to-day -day basis um, in the future? Um, I think my question will be, when we talk about transition design, which is a very, like a long-term thing and which very likely we wouldn't even see or experience it. We're basically planting a tree for the um, generation behind us. Um, like how how can we bring people together to talk about this? And com different communities have different, uh, I guess their level of comfort to talk about things is uh, varies a lot and I would love to learn like um, your, I, I would love to learn from your perspective, um, your suggestions on how to approach this. And, uh, and also like when we explain, for example, I'm trying to inviting, I'm trying to invite refugees to, uh, to participate, to test this workshop. Like how do we, um, I guess convince them to particip participate what sort of value or immediate value that they can see get all of this so that it will encourage them to participate yeah sorry I, I, I didn't plan this and it's very unorganized um, but yeah I would love to hear your feedback Cameron great thank you J just a quick question um, um, these are Refugees, though, with legal status in the UK? These, yeah, for now, yeah. yes. For this yeah. So they, they, they have some kind of uh, permit to be where they are, and they are a community, they're living in the community and uh, attempting to sort of rebuild their lives, having for now got through a certain stage of government access to the country. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so I, yeah, I just wanted to. Obviously, the the whole context is very uh, difficult, particularly in the UK at the moment around immigration politics and um, things like that. So I just I just wanted to get a clarification on on where these people are at because obviously it's very important to um, yeah be very mindful about their. Um, lived experience of their past, which is uh, obviously what's driven um, refugee status seeking. Um, the difficulties they would have experienced just trying to get through a fairly adversarial system uh, and then, you know, now trying to kind of rebuild lives in, in a new country. So it's obviously a, a really sensitive um, topic. Uh, I, th there is a lot of work on trauma-informed service design uh, and co-design in these kind of contexts. So I think I mentioned Kay and McKersh's work, um, which I would definitely look at. Uh, so their Beyond Sticky Notes book is an excellent guide to many of the issues about um, that that need to be observed when doing this kind of work and paying attention to intersectional politics in this kind of work. The I suppose the, so the first, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things and I'm not going to run, I'm not going to get through them in the right kind of order because I'm just ad-libbing and it's something to, to be quite careful about and you would, you know that, that's why you're asking the question about how to kind of do this. So um, definitely uh, working with people who have established relations with these people rather than trying to establish the relation yourself. So. Um, having trusted advisors who are able to kind of be present, that they trust uh, and that who are prepared to kind of bring you in 
uh, as you know, what uh, Laven Wenger call a legitimate peripheral participant into this process so that, so that you can be socialised in the right way. So definitely that's the first way to go. And the second way is um, ensuring, obviously, active consent in this uh, at every level. Um, never underestimate just how important it is to allow people to feel like they're being heard. And design is really important because it materialises what people say. So it's one thing to just sit across somebody and hear testimony about how they're trying to build their lives in, in the UK at the moment under uh, um, as the status of a refugee. It's another thing to try and work with them to allow their story to take a form. It could be a, a little graphic novel, a little uh, uh, short story, um, you know, it, it can just be kind of pictures with with uh, uh, word bubbles, but just something that they are participating. And it's like, oh, you are here to help me tell my story. And that's that's obviously a really important way to win trust. And it does an enormous amount for them. And it, then it becomes a really important data source. And it's a source of transition because it is giving presence and solidity to people who who are otherwise kind of stereotyped by a system that's trying to put them in a particular place. Um, the, the second thing, just picking up on the double diamond and where the way I understood you were using it, one of the things I think is interesting about a dumb and du diamond that I think is quite problematic in other ways, but one of the things that's useful about it is that the first diamond is kind of like problem. I mean, you should really be understanding the problem. You should be trying to understand um, don't just think you know the problem and you can just do a how might we and start solutioning. Some people say this is the third prior diamond, that there's three, and then some people just feel five, the whole thing gets ridiculous. But at least it kind of says spend time with the problem. Like you really have to understand the problem. And you have to understand their problem. You have to understand the problem sufferer. You understand you need to understand who owns the problem. Invariably, there is a problem because the problem owner is not the problem sufferer. So it's the first rule of problem solving, make the problem owner suffer the problem, which is what Extinction Rebellion and Stop Oil does, right? It literally kind of like brings the problem to, to someone who's at Wimbledon or something like that. Um, so I think it's really important to do problem defining, problem framing and problem reframing. And I don't know if any of you have encountered much of the work of Case Dorst and Frame Innovation Frame creation. Do any of you know this work at all? No. Um, so Case uh, works with me here at UTS, though he's in a different department, the stupidly named Transdisciplinary Innovation um, School, TD School. But he's an industrial designer by background, did a lot of work on researching design processes, but now he's a social designer. And I, in my mind, you know, some of the Western men who've done the most around social design and they're a lots of non-Western men who've done more, but the two Western men who've done the most around social design, Etienne Manzini and uh, Case Dorst. And I wrote this in a review in which I reviewed both their new books once. So Case's frame creation is a way of doing problem framing. The reason why it's important is that it allows you to let the lived experience of the problem, so these refugees, trying to work out how to live in this society under this status. You listen and you acknowledge. That is your experience of the problem. It sounds like a problem to me. I don't experience your problem. You have that problem. I hear you. I hear your problem. But what we need to do is not solve the problem, but find a way of articulating the problem in another way that will allow the system to begin to respond to it. Because at the moment, some people know you have a problem, they just don't care. Or, you know, so problem framing, reframing problems is this really important process that Case Dorst has spent time on. Instead of focusing on the solutioning diamond, frame innovation is a 10 step process for thinking about um, problem reframing. And I would just suggest it might be worth having a quick read, it's not hard, looking at some of the stuff that, that would be online about problem framing and using that in this context and not trying to get to whole visions and how you're going to do it. 
it's almost like that's too much. I would just say, and I've experienced that people with various types of intersectional injustices that they suffer, marginalized people, being able to re-articulate their problem in a way that other stakeholders begin to think, oh, I can I can help that. I can do something. The, the system can change. That is enormously powerful. So I I would just suggest concentrating on that problem reframing process because A, you, you may be abiding off more than, than could be done, and B, it's a really empowering thing. It's a, it's a really important way of allowing these people to name their own problem rather than saying, I want you to do a design process. So that was like my, my third crit. My third crit is this is all great. Just don't ever use the word design. Unless, unless they've kind of said, oh, we've moved to the UK and we, we've heard that design is big here and we want to be designers now, we don't really, you know, or, or we have our own version of what we understand design is, I want to do that. Like, unless they say the word, don't use it because it, it's, a, it's a really colonial kind of word in a way. So it's not about getting them to design, to tra even transition design their future. It's about letting them articulate their problems and letting them reframe their problems and helping them do that reframing, which you know is design and you can tell your tutors is design, but I don't think it'll help to tell them it's design. I think it'll help if they feel like this is a process that's allowing me to articulate some of the difficulties I'm having about living in the UK as a refugee. And this is a creative process. I'm, my problem is no longer just an oppressive problem. It's something I can help these people understand better. Yeah, I have a follow-up question on that comment. Um, yep. So when you get people, one of the uh, like uh, shared feedback I got uh, from refugee practitioners that you, when you get them start to talk about their uh, problems, it's all, uh, you know, it's like, it's almost unstoppable. Yep. And like their problem could be, well, if they're in a transition country, it's a uh, resettlement. That's what they want. And if they talk, if you talk to them about like living or like their current situation, where oh, I want a place to stay or I want like cheap food, like you know, it's uh, I guess how do you how do you sort of uh, not let the participant get all negative and sort of focus on the problem in a more positive tone. I wouldn't characterize it as negative and positive. And on the other hand, it's kind of like, don't discount them listing their problems because they're all problems and they do have a long list of problems. And it's a longer list of problems than, than most of us have. So I wouldn't want to delegitimate that. So the question is more like, how can you establish that this is, this is a venture looking at these particular types of issues? I understand you have many issues. I'm in a position to help with these ones. I think you also have those ones, but maybe you should just tell me. And so you you go in indicating the types of problems that you're in a position to help with. And so the visioning is therefore not an overpromise of like fixing all the problems. It's it's let's really think about these problems. And again, by focusing on the problem reframing, it's a matter of saying, um, let's let's focus on this one and let's try to get this one articulated in a new way. Again, in a Max Neffian way, what will happen with a, with a good problem reframe is that you'll reframe it to do synergic satisfies. Like you'll reframe it in a way that it points to solutions that are going to um, cover more than just the one problem they've named. So they'll get several problems solved, but they have to focus in one particular way rather than, yeah. But yeah, they've got long lists. And if you're a refugee uh, action support worker, you also suffer just fighting the government on their behalf. And a lot of the times you'd get really annoyed with the people you're trying to help because you know the problems and they know the problems and the problems are endless. There has to be this really careful way of saying, I hear that. I hear that. I'm not discounting that. 
Right. So, um, thank yeah. Thank, thank you both for sharing. Let me jump back in here. Um, uh, I've, I'm really grateful for everyone to share today. Um, we've, we are like at um, 30 now. We've used up all our time here. Um, I was actually, I, I apologize that <laughs> I, I kind of let the, the discussion run and um, we didn't really get time to kind of uh, discuss with one another what's coming up for all of us after hearing all four projects. But I was thinking we could do that on Slack actually. Um, and I'm proposing that maybe all of us could think about like, after this session today, um, is there any yeah a, any any question or any thought that that's really like coming up for you? Um, and and to yeah post it in Slack and and we can bring that discussion there. I think I think it'd be um really helpful and really rich. Um, and I think yeah I I expect we especially appreciate um to hear from you, Cameron. Like whether this this is valuable for you hearing. Um, our projects in this way, and whether, um, you yeah, know, if you have any thoughts or any, um, if you think that we could like shift in a way that we um, present these projects, like we, yeah, you know, we'd love to to hear, because um, we're hoping that this is also interesting and valuable to you. Um, but yeah, saying that, um, thank you all for for being here. Um, as usual, I think a few of us would be uh, planning to stay back and. Um, and discuss with one one another. Um, so yeah, please feel free to join if you can. Um, yeah, thank you all. Okay, and just I'm loving it. It's fantastic. I'm 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 getting so much uh, out of doing it. Uh, um, who knows if there's more productive ways of doing it? But it's proving productive for me. So don't worry about it. It's great. Yeah. Awesome. Anyway, awesome. thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I know. I know it's hard. It's hard doing presentations and getting critted at the best of times. It's particularly weird when you're talking to some insane person in Australia. So, and you have no idea where I'm coming from. So it, you were brave to have all done it. And I hope the f confused feedback, I, I'm, I'm particularly kind of worried about uh, that I was just really going theoretical on Lily and it wasn't particularly helpful at all. But anyway, um, I'm, I enjoyed it. I hope there was something value. And if I can be of more value on Slack, I will. So I like your idea about it any questions that suddenly occur to you that we didn't get time to discuss. Just just do it there. See you later. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, See you. Everyone. Thank you. Um, for the rest of us, yeah, same thing. Maybe we can take a, um, let's say, 15 minute break and then we'll come back here at uh, 15 minutes, be like 11.50 ish. Yeah, I'm going to stop recording now. Okay. Yeah, thank you.